You can't see it, but I can. Before I get started, I'd like to uh, just ask Gold Star families, any, any, any present, to stand up. And I saw a few on the way in. I know there are some here. I don't want you to applaud for them, because you don't applaud for that. But would you stand if you are a Gold Star family, lost somebody in war? Thank you. I think uh, my remarks are mainly with you in mind. To celebrate Memorial Day, we really need to go to a military cemetery. Now, we can't do that here. We're, we're in an auditorium, but I want you to come with me down to San Diego. There's a military cemetery there at Fort Rosecrans, which is at Point Loma. And to get there, you got to take a road. You drive this, be in this residential stuff, and you go down into the military installation. And the and the, and the peninsula there narrows. And on the right and on the left, you get down to the cemetery, and, and there's just open fields of, of graves and and lawn. And when you look to the left, which is to the south, there's this, it looks like a golf course. You know, you see these golf courses on TV, like in Augusta, these fairways that go forever, and that's the way it looks. And it's manicured, it's green, it's beautiful, and there are these, it's geometrical precision of these headstones that are interspersed there. And, we're going there because three people that I'm going to talk about today are there. So I want you with me when I talk about them, where they are. It's a very quiet, beautiful place at, uh, at, at the cemetery. People who go there talk in very quiet tones. You know, the wind blows, blows around, there's no traffic, uh, there's nothing to disturb you. The, the ocean, the mighty Pacific, is off to the right. Uh, you know, to the south is, is San Diego Bay. You can, see the, you can see the view of San Diego. And if you look even further south, you see Naval Air Station North Island. And beyond that, you can see the Naval Amphibious Base. That's where the SEALs are headquartered, and a lot of those guys are at Point Loma. And if you walk around the cemetery and you look at the headstones, the older ones have a date of birth, date of death, maybe what service they were in. The guys, more modern guys, have, have their, uh, they have a, a, a particularly distinguished uh, medal that they were awarded, such as a Congressional Medal of Honor. That'll be on their tombstone. You'll find a lot of the a lot of the tombstones. You'll look at the numbers, beginning and ending, and you'll say, "God, wait a minute, that guy's 22 years old." There's no sound of automatic weapons fire. There's no sound of explosions, mortars going off, or hand grenades detonating. And these are deafening sounds. You won't hear men yelling, maybe yelling on orders to other people. And you won't hear anybody moaning in agony. The clouds of gunpowder burned up cordite to the it's like a like a fog over the over the battlefield. It hits your your throat, burns your eyes. It's not there. It's tranquil.
The dead themselves can't talk to us. We can't talk to them. They can't tell us how they died, how they felt before they got close, when they knew something was, when things were really bad. Of course, everybody <laughs> holds on to that hope. Um, but they gave us, they gave us everything. Um, they held nothing back. And it's, it's my job to speak, I see my job today as speaking about the dead, but maybe also a little bit for them. And this is, I, I take this as a fairly, fairly heavy, profound task, I'll tell you. And uh, I want you to send me your energy. <laughs> In this role, it's kind of kind of ironic because when I was actually in the military, I uh, I was my last my combat service was leading a small group of very tough guys. Um, what'd you say, Marty? Pirates? Uh, they were we 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 were they, we were going through the swamps and mangrove swamps and jungles of South Vietnam, heavily armed on the hunt, looking for trouble. We were very fit, very tough, equipped for the task. And I, if, if you'd asked me then that you might be speaking for some of the people who would die at this <coughs> pursuit, I would have been shocked. But that's where I find myself today, speaking for those who have no voice. It's a big job. Just a little bit about me, I, I went into the Navy in 1963. I went on board a Navy ship, the USS Fletcher. I served on that ship for about 15 months. I just a sailor, uh, part of the ship's company. The, the high point, I guess, was riding on a typhoon in the Philippine Sea. That's a whole story in and of itself. <clears throat> it's not good. But uh, I did, I, I, I really actually in my life, I look back on it, uh, the brass ring was when I volunteered for, to go into underwater demolition training. And I, a lot of my brothers are here. I see Mr. McNair and Mr. Patton over there. And I'm sure there's some others. Um, every, every, Navy, every Navy SEAL has to go through something that's called BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition School. And it has a reputation well deserved for being very hard to complete. When I started it, I didn't know what was coming. I, I just knew that it was gonna be hard. So I said, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm alive, I'm gonna complete it. If they don't kill me, I'm gonna get through. And I think that's a fairly common attitude among those who successfully complete this. Because one of the major goals, at least in the beginning of it, is to get people to quit. They don't want anybody who's going to turn tail and step aside. They don't want people like that. So I did. I completed it, and I got to uh, Underwater Demolition Team 12. It was wonderful on the beach. I had this bunch of guys. I mean, they were such a wonderful bunch of people, athletic, fun, fun-loving. Uh, uh, we, we got up and we'd show up for work and do push-ups. How about that? Get paid to do that? Or maybe diving? Or jumping out of a plane, out of a parachute? Using parachutes. We did use parachutes. <laughs> Locking out of submarines, that's, that's an adventure in and of itself. Um, I did mention that when, I, when my class started, we had 150 sailors start that class. <laughs> 35 completed it. So you get some sense of the attrition rate. So I got, I got, uh, I was in UDT 12, and I got transferred to SEAL Team 1 in the spring of 1966 because that's when the leaders of our country decided that because the Vietnamese couldn't or wouldn't do for themselves what was necessary to preserve their government and what they saw as their way of life, that we needed to do, do it for them. And uh, so five months later, I was slogging through swamps and, and mangrove swamps and jungles in South Vietnam, 
setting ambushes at night, getting into firefights, um, and, and primarily our goal was we had we had missions that we were supposed to complete, but we wanted to stay alive. That was the goal. That was the main goal. Um, everybody came back from my my platoon. Um, we had 14 men, two officers and 14 men. I, I was in charge of six. While I was there, I, I saw people horrifically injured. Fortunately, no SEALs died while I was there. Um, but I was hurt myself. I spent some time in an Army field hospital. Came home, came back to Coronado, had some months on the beach there, became a civilian, became a lawyer, got married, had children. I've been very lucky. I'm a very lucky person. Much more lucky than the people we're going to talk about. And you know, when you think about children, I mentioned children. Uh, everybody, pretty much everybody here, has people they love. We got siblings, we got parents, we got children, we got wives, we got grandfathers, uncles, we got our family. Maybe we got friends that we truly love. And that's true for the 1.1 million dead of Americans going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. All of them were beloved figures. And when each one of them dies, there's a gap in the universe that appears. It can't be filled. It's like a bell that has been rung and you can't unring it. There's nothing you can do. You can't go back and say, hey, I forgot to tell you how great you were, how much I loved you, how much you enrich my life. You know, we had the singers up here, mother and two daughters, which were, they were so great I couldn't believe it. But think about that bond between them. I hope that, I, I, I do feel certain talking to Susan Zelensky that she, tells her daughters what they mean to her, but it's a good lesson for all of us to do that. But anyway, whatever goodbyes are said to the military who died, they have to serve us. They have to <laughs> suffice, because there isn't any do-overs. And what do you think the dead would want to say uh, to you today? If you could get somebody and bring them back to life, what would they want to say? I think they would say, Please remember me for doing my duty. I did the best I could. When courage was required, I gave everything. I held nothing back. Some might say, you know, I, I would have liked to have more of a life. I, I, you know, I wish I had kids. I wish I had, had a family. Had a job other than trying to kill people. Maybe they'd say, I forgot to tell my mother really how much she meant to me, how much I missed them, my family. But the truth is, they were seeking adventure just as I was, and they would probably say, I have no regrets, and I have pride that I stood up when I had to, and I never shirked my, my duty in the protection of my brothers, and I think that's what they would say. A great place to actually honor veterans is to go to Arlington in Virginia. I went there a couple years ago, and uh, I wanted to see the changing of the guard. They have a, a stage, like they, there's a big building to honor the, the, the unknown soldier, and there's a, a platform, much like this stage here, that's, that's on which the, the tomb sits. And there is, I think it's made of slate, uh, but the, there, there, there are sentries that walk up and down in front of that tomb, and they change the guards about every 20 minutes. It's very formal, it's very, you know, it's really interesting. I, I wanted to see it, and I, I did. And, uh, you know, you see that guard walking up and down, and every step he takes, his heel has got some kind of a metallic thing on it that makes a sound, and you hear that clack, clack, you hear anything else. And when he turns, he does a manual of arms, and he slaps that right. 
And it's very formal. In fact,